Okay, <clears throat> welcome to the first remote learning lecture. Hope you are all doing well from home confinement. <clears throat> we're going <clears> to <throat> skip over the nervous system for now, and we're going to come back, back to that um, after we do ecology. Um, not sure what's going to happen with school, if we're going to go back at all what the status of AP exams are, anything like that. So we're just going to keep keep moving along. Um, so for chapter 39, chapter 39 is about behavior. Um, we will actually be skipping <clears throat> 39.1, um, but just to start, a behavior is an action carried out by muscles under control of the nervous system, and it's subject to natural selection. <clears throat> we're going to be skipping muscle activity, um, and how muscle contraction works, and we are going to be skipping right to 39.3, which is all about behavior in ecology. Nico Tinbergen identified four questions that should be asked about animal behavior, what stimulus elicits the behavior, and what physiological mechanisms mediate the response. How does the animal's experience during growth and development influence the response? How does the behavior aid survival and reproduction? And what is the behavior's evolutionary history? <clears throat> behavioral, e behavioral ecology is the study of the ecological and evolutionary basis for animal behavior. Um, so obviously, uh, the, the way that an organism or animal behaves um, is going to make it either more or less adapted to, it, to its environment. Um, so behavior has um, an evolutionary root. Behavioral ecology integrates proximate and ultimate explanations for animal behavior. <clears throat> proximate causation addresses how a behavior occurs or is modified, including Tinbergen's questions 1 and 2. Ultimate causation addresses why a behavior occurs in the context of natural selection, including Tinbergen's questions 3 and 4. A fixed action pattern is a sequence of unlearned innate behaviors that is unchangeable. Once initiated, it is usually carried to completion. A fixed action pattern is triggered by an external cue known as a sign stimulus. Tinbergen observed this in male stickleback fish. Um, so basically male stickleback fish, they look like this at the top. Um, they have a red underbelly. Now what would happen is there is a response that occurs in these fish. So in male stickleback fish, the stimulus for attack behavior is the red underside of an intruder and this would cause a response by the fish. When presented with unrealistic models, however, the attack behavior occurs as long as some red is present. So here you can see an experiment <clears throat> where you have not male stickleback fish, but you have these other models with red bottoms that would also um, trigger this response, this fix fixed action pattern. And the stimulus, the sign stimulus, is the red coloring. <clears throat> Environmental cues can trigger movement in a particular direction. Migration is a regular long distance change in location. Animals can orient themselves using the position of the sun and their circadian clock, which as we know is an internal 24 hour activity rhythm or cycle. Um, they also use po the position of the sun and stars and the earth's magnetic field. Some animal behavior is affected by the animal's circadian rhythm, a daily cycle of rest and activity. Behaviors such as migration and reproduction are linked to changing seasons or circannual rhythm. Daylight and darkness are common seasonal cues. Some behaviors are, are linked to lunar, lunar cycles, which affect tidal movements. So lunar cycles, that's the moon. In behavioral ecology, a sign is a behavior that causes a change in another animal's behavior. Communication is the transmission and reception of signals. <clears throat> Animals communicate using visual, chemical, tactile touch, and auditory sound signals. Fruit fly courtship follows a three-step stimulus response chain. So the first thing that happens is a male identifies uh, a female of the same species and he turns towards her. And then there's chemical communication. He smells a female's chemicals in the air, um, the pheromones. Visual communication, he sees the female and orients his body towards hers. And then the male alerts the female to his presence through tactile communication. He taps the female with his foreleg. 
The male produces a courtship song to inform the female of his species. Auditory communication, he extends and vibrates his wings. If all three steps are successful, the female will allow the male to copulate. <clears throat> Honeybees show complex communication with symbolic language. A bee returning from the field performs a dance to communicate information about the distance and direction of a food source. So there are two different dances that the honeybee will perform. He will perform a round dance if food is nearby, and he will produce a waggle dance if food is distant. So basically, you can see right here, basically he wiggles his butt, um, and the direction, <clears throat> the angle to the sun, um, that his butt basically makes with the sun, uh, will indicate to other bees the direction of that food source. So let's take a let's take a look at um, oh, a little Walking Dead here. Um, let's see, waggle dance. Take a look at the waggle dance. Honeybees have some fascinating abilities, among them being able to communicate by performing a unique dance. It informs hive mates where a newly discovered food source is located. Every cycle of this waggle dance roughly describes the shape of the figure eight. Let's rewind and look in more detail. The bee only waggles on a part of its route, the straight run, indicated here by the waved line. The secret lies in the direction of the straight run, or to be more precise, in the angle between the straight run and the perpendicular, which in this case is 90 degrees to the left. This tells the other bees that food is available 90 degrees to the left of the sun. If the angle is 60 degrees to the right, they'll be flying 60 degrees to the right of the sun. <clears throat> okay, so for A, location A, the food source is in the same direction as the sun. Okay, here's A, same direction as the sun. For B, the food source is opposite the sun. So this one goes with this one. You can see that the waggle is away from the sun. And then C, the food source is to the right of the sun. So how far away... Um, equals the number of waggles. <clears throat> Many animals that communicate through odors emit chemical substances called pheromones. For example, a female moth can attract a male moth several kilometers distant. A honeybee queen produces a pheromone that affects the development and behavior of female workers and male drones. When a minnow, minnow or catfish is injured, an alarm substance in the fish's skin disperses in the water, causing nearby fish to seek safety. Animals can use diverse forms of communication. Nocturnal animals, such as most terrestrial mammals, depend on olfactory smell and auditory sound communication. Diurnal animals, those that are active during the day, such as humans and most birds, um, use visual and auditory communication. Um, learning establishes specific links between experience and behavior. Innate behavior is developmentally fixed and does not vary among individuals. Um, one example that I can think of of an innate, uh, innate, ugh, innate behavior would be um, kittens. Kittens automatically know to go to the bathroom in their litter boxes, which was always quite fascinating to me. It's just something that's innate. Cross-fostering cross studies help behavioral ecologists to identify the contribution of environment to an animal's behavior. A cross-fostering study places the young from one species in the care of adults from another species um, in order to see, um, you know, which type of behaviors are innate and which type of behaviors are learned. <clears throat> Studies of California mice and white-footed mice have uncovered an influence of social environment on aggressive and parental behaviors. Cross-fostered mice developed some behaviors that were consistent with their foster parents. Okay, so here was um, the influence of cross-fostering on male mice. Um, so basically these species, the, the, the young were taken and they were fostered by 
a different species. Um, and you can see we have California mice that were fostered by white-footed mice. Their aggression toward an intruder was reduced. Aggression in neutral situation in a neutral situation there was no difference and then paternal behavior was also reduced and then here you have the white-footed mice fostered by California mice um, so there was no difference in aggression towards an intruder um, increased aggression in neutral situation and no difference in paternal behavior so you can see um, that here here and here um, that had a social um, origin so in other words, um, that wasn't an innate behavior, it was actually changed by being fostered by a different species. <clears throat> in humans, twins studies allow researchers to compare the relative influences of genetics and environment on behavior. Um, so basically, you know, they study twins that have been separated um, at birth and they have found some fascinating results where, um, you know, the twins have the same profession, they married women of the same name, um, just all these similarities between two individuals, two twins that were separated at birth. So you can see that there is a highly genetic component um, to who we are and who we become. But there's also environmental influences on our behavior. So that's the whole nature versus nurture um, concept. Learning is the modification of behavior based on specific experiences. Imprinting is the establishment of a long-lasting behavioral response to a particular individual. Imprinting can only take place during a specific time in development called the sensitive period. A sensitive period is a limited developmental phase that is the only time when certain behaviors can be learned. An example of imprinting is young geese following their mother. Conrad Lorenz showed that when baby geese spent the first few hours of their life with them, they imprinted on him as their parent. The imprint stimulus in greylag geese is a nearby object that is moving away from the young geese. Um, so here on the left you can see Conrad Lorenz and the geese, and the geese were following him around um, because they identified him as a parent, basically. <clears throat> Conservation biologists have taken advantage of imprinting in programs to save the whooping crane from extinction. Young whooping cranes can imprint on humans in crane suits who then lead crane migrations using ultralight aircraft. So that's what's happening here. The cranes are following the aircraft. <coughs> spatial learning is the establishment of a memory that reflects the spatial structure of the environment. Nico Tinbergen showed how digger wasps use landmarks to find nest entrances. Um, so here we have a pine cones that are surrounding the wasp's nest. So if you were to do an experiment where you would move those pine cones, um, the wasp would think that the nest was still here when in reality it was over here. So he gets confused because um, you've moved his pine cones. So now he doesn't know where his nest is. A cognitive map is an internal representation of spatial relationships between objects in an animal's surroundings. For example, Clark's nutcrackers can find food hidden in caches located halfway between particular landmarks. In associative learning, animals associate one feature of their environment with another. For example, a blue jay will avoid eating butterflies with specific colors after a bad experience with a distasteful monarch butterfly. Um, kind of like the same thing in humans where um, if you eat something and you get sick after that, um, then you will always associate that sickness with that food that you ate. And oftentimes you may avoid that for the rest of your life. Animals can learn to link many pairs of features of their environment, but not all. For example, pigeons can learn to associate danger with a sound, but not with a color. Rats can learn to avoid illness-inducing foods on the basis of smells, but not on the basis of sights or sounds. Cognition is a process of knowing that may include awareness, reasoning, recollection, and judgment. For example, honeybees can distinguish same from different. Problem solving is the process of devising a strategy to overcome an obstacle. For example, chimpanzees can stack boxes in order to reach suspended food. Ravens obtain food suspended from a branch by a string by pulling up the string. Social learning is learning through the observation of others and forms the roots of culture. 
For example, young chimpanzees learn to crack palm nuts with stones by copying older chimpanzees. Culture is a system of information transfer through observation or teaching that influences behavior of individuals in a population. Culture can alter behavior and influence the fitness of individuals. Okay, I'm going to break this up into two separate lectures.